Okay, hello friends. Welcome to the Website Intelligence Podcast. Uh, this is Drago speaking. I'm here with my colleague Matt. And uh, today we're joined by Pedro Cortez, which uh, he will describe uh, uh, himself in, in more detail. I know only that he works uh, pretty extensively in the SaaS consultancy space. So, uh, Pedro, by the way, uh, where did you grow up in the first place? And... Uh, what would you say would be unique in that environment, in that landscape? Uh, yeah, so first of all, like, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so basically I grew up in Porto, Portugal, which is like the second biggest city in Portugal. Um, what I would say it's unique, it's it's probably, um, you know, it's what when I grew up, it used to be like really quiet. Now it's like full of tourists and stuff like that. I think the unique environment is just that we are like one of the smallest countries in Europe. And, uh, like Portuguese always have this mindset, uh, like going abroad and that's where the real opportunities are and all that stuff. Um, and yeah, I think, I think I, um, always thought like differently. I always thought how I can like go from Portugal to somewhere else, uh, like in the sense of how do I start something that I can start here and still have like an international business in like in, in that sense. So that's the, the kind of perspective I've grew up, uh, grew up with. And I think like a lot of young people still have the uh, goal of moving abroad, like to Switzerland and Fr France and Germany and all that stuff where, where they pay way more just because the minimum wage is like super, super low. Um, and I think also that's another thing uh, because it's kind of easy to feel successful when uh, you make several times the minimum wage. But I never let that um, get my ego high because uh, then I still wouldn't be making that much. I'll, I'll rather compare myself to the Americans, which is much more uh, realistic. So just just to follow up on, on that question. So essentially because you were mentioning you were traveling a lot as well. So uh, did you live in any other countries around? or? Uh, no, I didn't travel a lot. I mean that a lot of uh, young people feel like they need to like mm. move abroad. Uh, move abroad, uh, move abroad, and where the, that's where the opportunities are, and you can't really get like a nice career here and all that stuff. So uh, I always uh, was a bit of a stubborn guy, and I felt like that was the total opposite. So that's what I'm saying there. Is, is there some kind of um, like shift in the landscape in terms of is there more of a kind of startup environment? Is it getting a bit more interesting in terms of the kind of companies that are actually setting up in Portugal? Uh, yeah, but it's mostly because of the incentives. So the the government has provided like a lot of incentives incentives to uh, people to come here and start companies, like lower taxes and uh, maybe some sort of other incentives that I'm not aware of, uh, which don't really apply to me because I'm a, I'm not a foreigner. Um, but yeah, it definitely has like a bigger startup scene. Uh, Web Summit's here as well. Uh, but like I said, I've always had the focus of uh, like working remotely and going international anyway. So I actually never had an, a Portuguese client before. Okay. That's and cool. when you were young, kind of growing up in Porto, like you started having these kind of entrepreneurial ideas from when you were very young, or what was it that you wanted to be when you were, you know, kind of a younger kid growing up? Uh, yeah. So I always wanted to be an entrepreneur in some way, because my uh, grandfather was an entrepreneur. I didn't like uh, get to um, uh, meet him because he died when I was like uh, two years old or something. Uh, but all people always uh, speak highly of them, uh, of him in particular. And I don't know, I just have this obsession for, uh, uh, to be like, like him and stuff like that. Cause he had like, a, actually had a totally unrelated business. He had uh, the biggest boutique uh, in the city. Um, and he would travel around Europe and get like one, one of one type of items. And he would, uh, because there are a lot of rich people in Portugal because of the, uh, the colonies and all that stuff. Uh, so they, they, they had like a really big clientele and then he made a lot of money in real estate and all that stuff. So he was like, um, always was like my inspiration. So I wanted to be like him in some way. Uh, in my case, uh, when I was a kid, I was just like dreaming about uh, like building stuff and being almost like an uh, an inventor, like to say, because uh, I, I don't know, I still like to build things. I, I on on the side, I like to build stuff with uh, 3D printers and electronic stuff and all that, all those things. It's like totally random. Um, yeah, I just had a, also had a, an, an obsession with inventors and all that stuff. But over time, I figured out that marketing is where I liked uh, the most or where I should be doing instead. 
Yeah, I can I can definitely share share with you this at, at least this part that we are I mean business blood runs in the family and at at least I mean it shows it shows I mean you're always on a constant look for opportunities or the mm -hmm. curiosity which is manifesting since a young age especially in my case but <clears throat> if I'm thinking about marketing now because I lot I know to be honest lots of uh, marketing uh, people operating in this sphere and uh, most of them started with uh, some jobs in completely other spheres or other domains which was your first job uh yeah so is uh, actually not related uh, as well so not entirely related so um when i like i always had this obsession around like um not like flipping companies but but like almost like the almost like the profit show where they would come in, fix a bunch of stuff, and then the with by knowing numbers and changing the pricing and all that stuff, the business would be like completely different. So that sort of stuff I always liked to geek uh, geek out on, but there wasn't that much information to consume and all that stuff. And w the way I started paying more attention to it was uh, with uh, like mobile apps, uh, like probably back in twenty fourteen or something like that when that start getting like really big and UX design started going really big. And I always wanted to look at it in how can these companies like make more money or get like users to come back and all that stuff. So the, like the revenue part of it's where people were just focused on designing like pretty stuff. So um, without realizing it, I just stepped into the design world. I worked as a designer. I worked for like the, one of the biggest agencies in Portugal as well for like a few weeks. Uh, until I realized that I just wanted to work by myself, like I just confirmed that further. Um, and yeah, that's what I uh, what, that's what I did. I got like a freelance client as a first job, let's say, and then I went to the agency, and then I went back to freelance and all that stuff, right? And then eventually I realized that the money making side of things was what I was passionate about, not the design. Sounds great, and I, I know of you because um, we both work in B two B SaaS, right? And I've seen all of these like uh, website teardown videos and things. What made you like specifically focus on B2B like SaaS? Like what, what kind of created that kind of like um, real like niche focus in, in, in what you're doing? Uh, yeah. So always from a young age, I knew that um, like you, you need to stand out. So I knew that doubling down on one niche not only would make me like a much better expert, knew exactly what I was doing. People would see me differently. I do want to be like, um, I'm not an agency, like I'm more, more of a consultant. But uh, if you look at design agencies or marketing agencies, they like 99%, they look the exact same, the exact same message, the exact same design and all that stuff. So I didn't want to be someone like that where uh, I wanted to be like someone that would clearly stand out, right? If you want help with this thing in B2B SaaS, Pedro is the guy for it, right? So that's that's uh, that was always the goal. Uh, because I knew that's how uh, you would stand out. That's your, how you would create like a solid business. That's how you get like really good results for clients by doubling down on this stuff, right? And I'm very, very committed, right? So when when I um, I know that that's the thing that is going to work, I'm going to commit to it for for years to come. I, I've been I'm been committing to this niche for like seven years or something. Like I never dabbled, never sold anything else outside the niche. And the reason why I was curious about it, it was just like out of personal interest. I felt like SaaS was the the like the the future essentially, and that was the modern day uh, where the modern day inventors were and the innovators were. We're just creating like SaaS and changing the entire all those industries. I've always been obsessed with people that that change like industries either by something that they invented, like a machine they invented or stuff like that. So that's why it stood out. Um, and yeah, I, I stuck to it because I only see the niche growing and growing over time. And at the time where I started doing it, there wasn't anyone saying that I help companies with messaging or help clients with landing or SaaS companies with landing pages, just designers that were hired by, um, or consultants that were hired by SaaS companies. No one was doubling down on that niche. And still to this day, people do like SaaS and e-commerce or SaaS and tech companies, they never really double down or they do B2C SaaS and B2B SaaS. Like, I don't know, they're just like afraid to commit or something. There, I see plenty of opportunity uh, with B2B SaaS alone. I was just asking you because you have a pretty extensive uh, experience in, in the SaaS industry. By the way, how many years is it? Yeah, it's probably like six, seven years. 
Okay, so six, seven years. So you might see trends come and go, companies come and go. Mm-hmm. Which, I mean, what would you what would you think would be some uh, de- definitive trends at the moment in 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 the SaaS business? Uh, yeah, I think uh, probably the two biggest ones would be uh, like around content marketing, around the product like growth, like type movements, um, and and stuff around those lines, but. Mainly what I've seen like come and go are more, are more like the tools themselves, right? Where uh, you like start uh, uh, SaaS had a huge boom when they were like replacing uh, like spreadsheets or 90% of your com- competition was like spreadsheets. Uh, and then the, essentially what your landing page needs to talk about is uh, it would have to talk about how you can make them more money, how it's better than other tools, how easy it is to get started. So those are the pillars that I always talk about in my videos and all that stuff. Uh, that you need to answer, like the high level ones. Uh, essentially on the parts where you need to explain why it has to be better, you're always like comparing it to a spreadsheet or comparing it to doing it manually, right? So the trends, like the biggest one that applies to every SaaS company is that it's very rare nowadays that I speak with a, a SaaS company that might be looking to, to get help with their conversions and with their messaging and all that stuff um, that doesn't have a competitor that is not... Um, it doesn't have like a bunch of big players that doesn't have like this huge company that is, uh, has a lot of funding and is acquiring customers at a loss just to kill all the competitors and all that stuff. So it's very rare where it's, where they're the first guys in one niche and revolutionizing the uh, revolutionizing the space. Just, I don't see that happening anymore unless you're like, uh, really good at finding opportunities. That's, that's something that has, has uh, changed quite a lot. I guess like with this increased competition, or we certainly like feel that working in MarTech, uh-huh. it's like there's there's increased uh, focus on things like brand initiatives, which never used to really be a big part of, you know, B2B SaaS. And then uh, also just this whole focus on um, frictionless experiences. So there's tiny uh-huh. little differences that can make the experience, the whole process from, you know, discovering a new platform to signing up to it, to getting to use it. It's those tiny little tweaks now, which seems to make the biggest kind of difference. How, how do you think like B2B SaaS, like the advice that you give and the consultancies you give within B2B SaaS, what do you think makes them kind of very unique uh, to different sectors? Like what's very specific to B2B SaaS that's not there in other sectors as well? Like uh, what do you mean by other sectors, like uh, other industries or like specific B2B SaaS? What, what is... Uh... Yeah, I mean, like, so for example, an agency that deals with completely everything, right? So they're mm-hmm. dealing with e-commerce, they're dealing with uh, all sorts of different uh, sectors and industries. Whereas because you're completely focused on B2B SaaS, uh, when it comes to things like landing page conversion, that main thing you focus on, mm-hmm. you think most of the, the advice that you give applies kind of across the board universally, or there's something specific to B2B SaaS, which you really kind of focus on and have now gained expertise in you know, over the last six, seven years. Yeah, so um, it's actually, uh, obviously there are a lot of things that you can like reuse and some of the tweaks that would work. But the way that is, the thing that changes the most is the way people think about software and the way that um, you actually need to sell software uh, and how you explain it in the first place, right? So there are a lot, a lot of uh, nuances that make selling software way harder than than it is to sell like a boot or something in an e-commerce store or sell normal services because it sometimes is not as... uh, tangible, especially when you have like SaaS that has AI or SaaS where you're supposed to automate some of the tasks you do, like the savings sometimes aren't as tangible and you have to be the one figuring out ways to quantify them, right? So there are a lot of nuances in SaaS. So for example, they might be worried, they might be a fearful of tech in the first place. They, uh, tech might be this unknown thing that they have this, their own preconceived uh, notions, uh, like uh, misconceptions about. They might think is, is going to be like very v- buggy. Are they going to be like hidden fees? Like if we're talking with SMBs, some most of the time they're afraid of tech. So if they feel like it's not going to be easy to use, they feel like their team is not going to use it. They're not going to get value out of it. They're probably going to be stuck with the contracts or something like that. Uh, they they uh, It's very hard to convince them because they're rather stuck with their old way of doing it. Unless you're like insanely good at explaining why it's, why the using your software is 10 times better than what they're using now. If they feel like it's 10% better, even if it's even, even in, in the rea- reality is like 10, 10 times better and they only see like 10% better, then they're not going to converge, right? So there are a lot of nuances around 
uh, setup time and changing processes. Uh, if you have to change processes, adapting to a tool, uh, objections around compliance, uh, objections around how it works, uh, uh, different members of the team being able to use it, uh, how they want to use it, like literally a million things that you want to make sure that you answer on the website when they're trying it out, literally everywhere, because this messaging stuff kind of shows up in the full funnel area at this point, right? So there are a lot of nuances. I wouldn't trust anyone that is, that hasn't worked with B2B SaaS only to uh, optimize uh, like the website and all that stuff. Cause you're just going to miss a lot of objections. I uh, was talking to a guy the other day and uh, I almost have this uh, different view of the world. I cannot see a single page that um, that is not missing something, right? Uh, it's very hard for me to promote like good examples, man. Cause I find them like one, a good one once a year. Cause I only see problems at this point. I'm like the engineer type mindset when I look at this stuff now. Yeah, it's so true. And I just would like to add my two cents on the trending of uh, SaaS or what actually trends mm -hmm. in the market in terms of SaaS and specifically in terms of B2B SaaS, because it's coming actually from the B2C sector. We see so many companies actually acquiring uh, content houses and essentially morphing. So B2B software morphing into these media houses and starting to have also media strategies in order to push their product. So launching podcasts, also TikTok is very popular, which was, which we were actually surprised uh, seeing that in terms of B2B software. So essentially <clears throat> putting content first at the first uh, pillar of, uh, of your push strategy, but <clears throat> moving, moving on. Uh, thinking about your extensive career in marketing and more specifically in the B2B marketing, because each of us actually is defined by moments, which would be like two, three key moments in your career, which you think would be definitive for, for your career. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So probably one was when I switched from, um, like being a designer, designing all the pages for them and sending it out. That was probably like five years ago, I would say. Um, and what would happen then is they would get like really solid results. They get that like quick win. They get like boosting conversions. And then what would happen is the results would either like stagnate or go down over time because I was the only guy that knew why I converted in the first place. Right. So doing everything for the client was actually not, not ideal for them. And that was, uh, I, and that was a high moment because of two things, right? So one was the results, right? Because I can get them really good results, but they, they are not really able to sustain them. Um, and then the second thing was that, um, I wasn't like, people were just hiring me because I was really good at, um, um, like taking the views of 10 different people and figuring out what, uh, and what they're saying is why, uh, why, uh, people are buying the products and condensing it into something that is really clear once I, and I realized that, uh, I was essentially like a really natural copywriter instead of a designer. Uh, designer always came, uh, the design part always came natural to me because I used to draw as a kid, like everything that I can, that I look at, I can essentially copy or break down into patterns. So it's like very easy to, uh, to come up with like something that looks good if I have like enough reference. Um, so that was one aha moment where I doubled down on it. Uh, then probably the second aha moment was when I started doing like a lot of research Um on the copywriting set of things, what makes a good landing page and all that stuff. And because I also love like a lot of psychology books and I love to figure out how stuff works um, and stuff like that, I I looked at the tips that other people were giving and I thought, okay, this doesn't make any sense. People are not going to buy because of this. This is not tailored for SaaS. This makes no sense. I'm just going to give up learning from these guys altogether, right? So what I did is I spent months and I have like a huge collection of the most random copywriting books you'll ever see from um like uh like alt articles from the 1970s to uh books on people that used to sell uh via direct mail to like all sort of these stuff so what I, what i essentially i thought about is who are the people that had to make it right the first time right and those old copywriters had to make it right first time because the campaigns were so expensive that if they didn't work they would go out of business right um, so I learned from those guys to figure out how does this apply to SaaS, even though it, this is like 30 years old. Uh, and that's how I came up with all my pillars. I test them over the last, uh, five years since I, uh, started on that journey. 
And then I've, I've iterated, obviously. And then, um, you know, th uh, to this point, they're almost like my uh, SaaS copywriting uh, laws, let's say. Where, where can we get a hold of this? <laughs> Uh, all those uh, laws. I mean, essentially, I, I like to share them on LinkedIn from time to time. So I say, what are the principles you need on a pricing page? Or what do people need to understand to choose a plan? And what's keeping them from choosing a plan? Uh, they're always, I always have this uh, psychology like perspective to it because people need to understand why they buy and why they don't buy, why they hesitate to buy it, how they compare different tools, how they see uh, your tool uh, elsewhere in the market, right? Because they're not seeing your tool uh, it's everything is relative, right? So they're always looking at your tool compared to something else, compared to what they're doing now, compared with what you're considering, uh, what they're considering to buy. Because even if they're using a spreadsheet, they have considered other tools, they have heard of other tools before, they have checked them out. So where do you still right there in the middle where you feel like, uh, like the best of both worlds? That's what you need to come up with. That's all the things I'm always preaching, either on YouTube or on LinkedIn. And then I boil it down into actual tips on what the headline should look like, good examples that I'm featuring more recently, uh, applying that to landing pages that I've seen that are bad and how I would rephrase it instead, that sort of stuff. Sounds great. And I obviously, like I mentioned before, I, I first discovered what you were talking about on LinkedIn. You, you then mentioned YouTube as well. Mm -hmm. the, the next section of, of this podcast, we usually talk about websites and what role the kind of website plays. Do, mm -hmm. you, do you have a website? Do you drive traffic to a website or is purely YouTube, LinkedIn is kind of your way of connecting with, with your audience? Uh, yeah, so I do have a website, but all the website does is um, it's just like a place to see the case studies, see what I offer. Um, it used to have like a, more of a blog, but there aren't that many keywords to rank for. That's why I, I went to uh, uh, LinkedIn and YouTube instead. Um, and I'm like uh, growing that stuff. LinkedIn is like really good. Uh, YouTube is just a little bit harder because there are also that, not that many keywords and it takes longer to get momentum, but it's still working well. And uh, the goal is to just be where, where your customer is. Um, and um, yeah, I just have like a, a few ways that I think about this stuff, right? So one is I need to talk about programs that only the type of clients that I wanted to try have. So therefore, when I post something and when I critique something, when I give a tip, I only attract people at that exact stage, right? Then I have like guides. I have like a landing page cheat sheets that I promote often, which is the actual landing page that I, the formula that I use with clients. So I promote that all the time. It has like very step-by-step. -step. I don't hide anything. I literally have a video explaining how do I do it, the examples, all that stuff. And the reason why I do it is because if they come with this belief of how something should be done and I'm able to change it. If they come with a false belief and I'm able to change it with something else, uh, then they, that's what generates authority, right? So they now see me as the landing page guy. They now see me as the guy that has everything step-by-step step, uh, where if he's able to boil this down into such a specific formula, then this ha has to be the guy to do it, right? So that's how I do it. I just focus on attracting people that way. I generate 90% of the sale, 90% of the authority in the videos themselves. So the videos are my landing pages, let's say, or the posts, because sometimes they're written posts. Uh, and then the website is just like the next step. It's just like uh, justifying the uh, all the respect that I've gathered from, uh, from the platforms where they say, okay, these are the case studies I had. This is how it might apply to you. This is a call that you should book uh, to see how it might apply to you, right? So it's just like the last 10%. I haven't touched that in like, like nearly two years, I would say. I would just add a case, new case study. So, and that's like a good way to do it. It just means stuff works. And then you just need to add more people to the top of the funnel. That's the that's the dream, right? So, so uh, seeing that you're actually a landing page grandmaster, how would you think uh, everyone should think about structuring a landing page? In what way or what kind of framework should someone apply to when it comes to uh, designing a landing page in your opinion? Um, yeah. So there are a lot of um, like little steps, but the first thing that I would do is I wouldn't even think about the landing page in the first place, right? Because the very first thing you need to think about is what are your offer? What is your offer? What is unique about your product and stuff like that? So let's say every time I get like, um, every time like I get a new client and they want to redo their landing page, I'm going to help them out and guide them and all that stuff. They always go through, um, uh, an onboarding exercise 
where we figure out without thinking about headlines, without thinking about images, without thinking about the, what the structure is, without thinking about anything. Because if you start to think about uh, multiple things at a time, it's just going to get stuck. It's going to start diving into details. And that's like um, diving into details is like a lazy way of doing it because it doesn't force you. It doesn't force you to find the underlying problems, the underlying results that people want to have, right? So what, what I do is I, I let the clients have this like one page thing uh, that I call the link canvas. So sometimes I share it as well, where it's um, like the lean landing page canvas because link canvas is something else where they just put, okay, here are the problems that people are looking to solve. Here are the problems with other tools. Here's why we think uh, what, what our USPs are. Um, here's how long it takes to get started, all that stuff. So they list like four things more or less, like in a table. And then what happens is, is I come in and I kind of help them out. Um, and then the, here's the problem. And this, this is the main problem besides like the actual formula and all that stuff that, uh, SaaS companies have is they don't have clarity on what is the actual problem that they're solving. Right? So let me give you an, um, let me give you an example. I have this client that has an interior project management tool and, um, you know, previously they start talking about the problems they have, right? So uh, the problems they would fix or the problems with other tools. So the problem was they wouldn't be able to gather all the items and then like see them at a glance. Um, uh, so they're able to order uh, like a lamp or like something for the kitchen and make sure that all the, uh, everything kind of arrives in time. That's like a problem, right? And that's a solid problem. But the thing is, what is behind that problem? The, the problem behind it is that if they don't have full clarity on, on where every item is, uh, how many have been ordered, how long is it going to take? That means they're either going to miss uh, deadlines. They're going to spend three times as much to go through the reports. They have to create reports manually for the builders to actually execute on the interior design part. And the biggest part is they cannot take on more projects, right? And we cannot promise this um, directly. So I have to explain it indirectly. So we have to say, and this is like gets very complex, but basically it says we show them how they, um, how they can make the how they can gather the projects. They have the bird's eye view. It generates the reports automatically. They're mistake free because they are generated automatically. Every time you, you uh, update a new item or remove it from the list, it gets auto, auto, uh, automatic, uh, uh, automatically updated. You don't have to do anything. There's no way they can make a mistake. You don't have to do, like tri triple check things. And then you just have to focus on the, on the design, right? And that means, and then we also back this up with case studies, that you can take on more projects, right? And that's what people realize by themselves is that they can take more projects because of this tool that is so much more streamlined than what they're doing now, right? And that's that means instead of the tool being worth a hundred bucks a month, now that means I can take uh, an extra twenty thousand dollar project every single month that I couldn't take before, right? See how much more different that is. That's how we make it as irresistible as possible. So. The thing that most people do wrong, besides the formula, besides using images, besides what headlines they use and what features they talk about, that's like, that's a million other problems. The biggest problem is they're not really clear on the, what is the underlying problem that people uh, want, uh, want to fix or the result that they want or, or the fear that they have, right? So they need to dive uh, really deep at the beginning and then it just, the page writes, them, it writes itself after that. Yeah. And then in doing that, I guess they therefore then, like you said, they present the value like in a really clear way. Because yep. it's not just like, oh, you know, we help you find all these things in one place. It's like we help you make more money. <laughs> it's a much bigger value. It makes complete sense. Um, you mentioned a little while ago that it, you find it very hard to find an example of a kind of SaaS page, which is like ticks all the boxes. You know, mm -hmm. you said maybe one or two a year. Can you give us an example of, of one that you would hold up as like a North Star? Like this is this is a, a brand, this is a company within this space that kind of gets it right um, and you couldn't really add too much more to what they're doing currently. Yeah, that is like extremely hard to say. Uh, what I usually feature as good examples um, are like the base camp pricing, but that's not only the pricing page, right? That, that's The pricing page is explaining the model that you have, right? So they have just a really good model that people love which is the unlimited uh, contents and the unlimited projects and all that stuff. What that means is removes a really big fear that people have around SaaS pricing, which I cannot guess how much I'm going to pay because it's very hard for me to estimate how much um, 
how much am I going to use, right? So if you have a SaaS company uh, that uh, charges based on something, they're not really clear on how much they need, then they're not, they, they, they don't know how much they're going to actually pay. They fear they're going to charge you more and stuff like that, right? So they really answer that fear really well and position, position themselves like really well in that, in that sense, right? Even though it kind of cheapens the, the, the product. Then the second one is probably going to be Monday.com. Their page isn't that great, but the offer is really good. Uh, or at least how they're perceived is really good. And the reason why it's good is because instead of saying it's another project management tool, they position it in a way where you're building it yourself, right? So you're taking the parts that I really like, you customize it to your team, and then you just use whatever parts you want, right? And that's really appealing because it feels like you're building your own project management tool, something that a tool that adapts to your process, not uh, your process, not like a team's process that has to be adapted to the tool, which is the biggest objection that people have around project management tools. Is for example, uh, for example, Asana. You need to do like the getting things done framework, uh, to do list. I think it's based on around the same. Um, yeah, and they they always like double down on these frameworks. You cannot adapt it to you. The team doesn't use it, and then they just turn and try something else. And that's like the probably the most competitive uh, space in SaaS. Right, so that's what they've done really well. Like a few other examples, kind of hard to uh, come by, to be honest. And those two are great. Perfect. So moving into the uh, last question of, of our current segment would be whenever you're launching a strategy, we know from, from experience and even from our uh, campaigns we ran uh, recently, that obviously it's really essential to keep an eye on the analytics side of things and to the user of the, uh, the behavior of the users on your, on your website, mm -hmm. whenever you're looking or you would like to get this bird view, like you mentioned before, what kind of, uh, KPIs are you looking at? Uh, yeah. So I'm looking at the KPIs that are, uh, directly related to revenue. So anything that is not re directly related to revenue, then I'm not gonna I'm, I'm not gonna focus on vanity metrics like bounce rates or um, like how many people checked this blog article or a leak magnet that is totally unrelated to what the product does. Uh, how many people downloaded that? I couldn't care less about it. Uh, what we need to fo the way I look at it, a business is that I try to simplify it as much as possible. So how many people visit the website? Where actually, where do they come from? Because they might have this expectation around where they come from, uh, and that we need to address and the messaging as well. So how much, how many people do we have coming in every single day, uh, or a month? How many trials or demos do we get? How often does that convert into a customer? And then how much do they pay? Right. And then I look at those opportunities and figure out, okay, so. Uh, how can we get more people to uh, book demos in the first place? How can it get more people to turn into a customers by explaining the value better uh, on, in the first few days of the trial, for example? Because this is all related to messaging. And then we figure out where the low-hanging fruit is. Sometimes the low-hanging fruit is just uh, if we realize that we have like four plans and 80% of the people are in the second biggest one and the second uh, smallest plan, then probably the biggest opportunity is just to upsell them and convey the value really well of what the next plan is about. Because you have to realize that once people sign up, they probably never even check the pricing page. They're probably not aware of the features they're missing out on, right? So just making that obvious is might make them just double the business because they get people to pay more, right? That's uh, one thing. So what I'm saying here is that sometimes not the landing page, um, even though it's still related to messaging. Uh, so another client I have, we looked at their stats and we realized the main reason why people book a demo is because they submit it uh, and we can even trace it down to the emails when they submitted that form and once they actually booked the call is they always watch this five minute demo on their page before coming in. Um, and what happens is because we noticed that's like a buying pattern, now what we're going to be doing is how about we just promote the hell of, out of that demo video. That we show it on, on all your blog posts. Uh, obviously, that we make it sound like more valuable. That we tweak the page itself so we get that page to convert a little bit better. That we're also working on tweaking the video as well, right? So, uh, if we notice that that's the thing that drives the most leads, 
then we're going to promote it more. We're going to phrase it better. We're going to communicate it better. Uh, we're going to do the transition between watching that demo video and booking the call smoother. And that's the thing that's going to drive the biggest results before you even get to the homepage. Right? So that's where I find opportunities really. And in terms of like kind of going on from that, that question beyond kind of analytics or even just beyond thinking about uh, tech in that area, what kind of like tech or what kind of tools do you use like in your, in your role and in the, in the kind of work you do, do you have like some go-to platforms mm -hmm. that you religiously use or it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's mainly just adapting to what the, um, the clients are using as well? Uh, yeah. So the thing with, uh, like working with people in general, regardless if they're clients or friends or whatever, is they, um, it kind of requires like a lot, uh, like you need to create some sort of momentum where they want to like change a tool or it takes like a lot of effort and, and like a lot of mental energy to switch from one tool to another. And to be honest, most of the analytics tools, there are some analytics tools that are really good, but like the heat maps tools and all that stuff, they're basically copies of the, of the same tool. Uh, they, they are copying each other. Uh, it's, 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 it's not ideal. They always do the same thing. So what the perspective that I have with clients until I find this amazing tool that kind of tracks things and, and, um, and, uh, just simplifies the whole thing where it's kind of easier to have a bird's eye view instead of having like a million metrics that overwhelms the clients. It's just, I just tell the clients saying, okay, these are the four metrics that we want to measure measure. So we, essentially the, the metrics I look at is how many trials or demos do we get? How often do, did that turn into customers? How much do they pay? Right? Because we want to figure out, because sometimes the positioning change or the messaging change that we do is so we attract bigger companies. And then we want to figure out if, okay, if you want to attract bigger companies, then we change the messaging according to that. And then maybe that gets us more demos or maybe it gets us less demos because that happened before. It gets us less demos, but then we get like huge deals in the back, right? Because I had clients where they had like a $5,000 um, uh, average and uh, their demos didn't go down or, or something just be because we found a way to have like an overlap where we just get more enterprise deals without losing on the rest, which was a little bit tricky. And then they started, they started because we tracked that, they started getting like, multiple multi five figure deals and all that stuff. So, um, yeah, it's kind of, I just focused on tracking like three main things, be really biased towards revenue. Even if like they get less trials and they make more revenue, I couldn't care less. Everyone's happy. Right. So yeah. that's what we want. It's just uh, tracking that stuff. And I let clients use whatever they're used to using because it just makes, makes uh, things simpler. Um, uh, yeah. it makes, it, it makes, uh, it makes sure that actually things get tracked because if they focus on something else, it's probably not going to get properly set up. Um, or they're just not going to know how to use it. it. Just takes more time. And then just it's like a, building a momentum in the opposite way, like in the worst way possible. Instead of mil building like some positive momentum, instead, let's yeah. just use whatever they want. And then we figure out the three or four main metrics we want to track. And they're tracked properly. Makes complete sense. Just sounds like very streamlined. You know, kind of just really concise down what that journey looks like. You know. The journey from a page not converting so well, the journey from not attracting the right kind of customers and the kind of revenue you want. It's kind of fixing those things in that very like simplistic, like four step kind of way. Mm -hmm. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, because I just will insist a bit on this, on this note, because uh, as you described it, you seem that you're also selecting the channels of communication or uh, the mediums you're using to reach potential customers. And obviously we know evolving from year to year, all the mediums might change. This year works this, that year works that. Which medium would you describe or you, you saw from your experience performing well in the last, let's say six months or recently? Uh, by medium, you mean like a marketing channel or something like that? Exactly, exactly. Marketing okay. channel. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the thing with um, with marketing channels uh, and what I usually advise is you just have to be whatever your customers are and whatever way they're like consuming it. So if other people are using like outbound is working really well, or if other people are using TikTok and is working really well, um, I always tell my clients to not look at it that way. And in terms of what others are doing, just figure out whatever your customers are and just don't focus on anything else, right? Because for example. Um, uh, let's say I have uh, a client that wants to attract like really big enterprise companies uh, and, and all that stuff, right? Where most of the deals are made with network and advance and all that stuff. I'm not going to tell the clients to create like a TikTok or spend like 20 hours a week 
maintaining that type of content when they should just double down on uh, creating amazing content in webinars and events, maybe their own events uh, and how they position that and how they promote that versus going with what other everyone else is doing um, and is not even going to attract the people that they want, right? So uh, f- that's the same thing uh, on my end, right? I could be creating a million blog posts, but I know that uh, there are a lot of keywords that I cannot like rank for. So I'd rather just double down on LinkedIn, connecting with people that uh, are in my uh, network. So uh, those are the ones uh, that are looking at my content, the right people are looking at my content. That's all I need. And that's all a SaaS company needs, right? So this is the trial and error parts that I, uh, that I always don't like with SaaS companies whenever they're finding like a new marketing channel. It's just you have to figure out if that attracts the right type of people, right? Uh, you should never copy what everyone else is, is doing. That's what I tell them. So, what, so unfortunately, the answer is different for every company depending on who they want to target. Yeah, makes sense. And I guess it's also linked to process, right? Like you have, you have process in terms of the messaging that you talked about, like trying to figure out what that problem is that's being solved, therefore what the real value is. I guess it's the same when it comes to channels. It's really figuring out who your ICP is where they're getting information, what kind of information yep. they want and, and doing things in this way. Yeah, well, I just great. found like a really good example that I forgot about. Um, so I have this client that has um, like a, a business, like a SaaS business to, it's like a project management tool for sign shops, um, mostly in the US and Canada and what and the UK as well. That seems to be a big market. And um, what happens is, most of the, those people are either on Facebook or reading industry magazines. Like, you know, it's like crazy old school, but it's, uh, it's, the, it's the truth. And what happens was, is uh, they, they had like the opportunity to do like a guest post and stuff like that. And uh, you, the client wasn't going to tell me about it uh, because he thought like it was just an article, something not really related. So what we've done is actually said, hey, that's actually a big opportunity. You're going to be in front of your audience. Let's just think of that article almost like a landing page. I'll help you outline it and and uh, and rephrase it in another in a, another way. So not only the articles was insanely valuable because uh, I we talked about the three main uh, project management problems that people had. So we attracted people with those exact problems, and we essentially we showed like project management tweaks that help you double the profits per project. So it was like uh, quoting properly. It was like. Um, um, like a few other things, uh, which built a lot of authority. And then by the way, we said, Hey, the guy that wrote it is the founder of this tool, uh, and so on and so forth. That fixes the issues above, like just a small sentence. And they re- hit the record month in the last five years, because not only they got in, in the, uh, in their exact audience, we made it a perfect transition between reading and talking about the problems they have and really just building up the pain of the problems they have and then showing that, that there's a perfect tool to do it, even if it is on the about the author section, just like literally one sentence. And then uh, also, uh, he also got to be a long-term contributor uh, to the article because people found it insanely valuable, right? So uh, this is this is really about how you frame uh, everything, right? Sometimes the best channel might be and something as uh, old school as that. Right? Yeah. Just sorry, depends on sorry, the sorry to cut. Sorry to cut in there. So mm-hmm. basically, you say, okay, you're writing the article, you're producing the content, but how then you're going ahead and leveraging the content? So how are you going to reach with that content your target audience? What did you use to push this this uh, article? Uh, yeah. So that article in particular for that client, it was uh, an industry magazine. So the in, the magazine already had their uh, own audience. And um, they publish it on their website. I assume they publish it to a physical magazine as well. And they uh, p- uh, promoted it to their newsletter that had around 10,000 sign shops, um, right? So uh, th- they got like a bunch of people to look at it. People loved it. People shared it. They uh, understood, like we planted it in their head, the project management problems they have, even if they're not ready to buy it. So every time they face that problem, it becomes like a bigger and bigger pain because they're now they're like really aware of it until they start looking for a solution like that. So it works like both ways. And uh, yeah, in this particular case, they just, um, uh, the magazine itself, it was already like promoting it. Now, because they really liked it, now we're just a long-term contributor. The clients can do like uh, 10 of these a year or something. And that that's almost like free ads. Just a whole right? new it's, it's channel. Be- it's, yeah, it's, it's better, better than channel. building his own audience. 
Yeah, that's just, I mean, it just sounds crazy. It's like that kind of marketer's dream, right? <laughs> Sometimes yeah. you, you, you kind of work on these partnerships, you uncover something, a database that really fits, you know, some kind of real nice kind of match there. And having this on a regular basis must just be a dream. That sounds great. You, um, yeah. obviously you, you talked a lot about, you know, B2B SaaS and this whole um, niche that you've been focused on for the last six, seven years. Um, are there any aspects that you're kind of focused on now, like for the next six to 12 months of learning more about or kind of like trying to um, bring into, into the way that you approach clients as well? Are there new mm -hmm. things or, or new ideas that you want to also start to learn more about and to, and to implement as well? Uh, yeah, so um, the main things that I want to learn more about um, are around um, like providing like even quicker wins because what I've been noticing recently, and I do have like mentors and people to bounce our ideas off of this stuff, is um, I realized how much of a professionalist I'm, I'm like still am. And I didn't like realize it. I thought I was kind of over it. But then I noticed that I probably go so in depth into one page. And obviously that's where they convert like super well, but they, they could be a part of me that could, that could still go even deeper and find the 80, 20 out of the stuff that is already working. So it would be even easier for clients and even easier for when I bring like other people on the team to help clients implement and all that stuff. So the, the more I double down on the stuff, the more patterns I find, the easier it is for clients to implement, the more results they get, the faster they move on to the next thing the more results they get again. So to me, it's just um, becoming a little bit more aware of where I've been like too professionalist, uh, too perfectionist uh, and finding the 80-20 of that, finding the 80-20 of a bunch of stuff that I, that I help clients with, like the normal tweaks I have, like for pricing and promoting like a new plan and the homepage itself and the comparison pages and finding out how to make it even easier without redesigning the whole thing. That's one thing to focus on. And then the second thing to focus on is just working with clients like super long term, like more than one year. Like I want to build a type of business when I work with clients like for two or three years uh, and we find endless opportunities and we make them like 100x whatever they paid. Um, right. And, and that's probably the profession is speaking again, because I probably make like an average of more than 10x uh, what they pay me. Uh, but still, I, that's the kind of business that I want to build. And for me to get there, I need to get better at conveying. Um, uh, at conveying like the value of the service, at finding these opportunities so that they're quicker, uh, quicker to change, um, to constantly find even more opportunities based on the ones that we already implemented. Uh, so yeah, it's just taking the stuff that I already do and becoming a complete like uh, it's just like the mastery process, like becoming better and better at it. Um, in this case, is is in the the day to day trenches of of working with clients and making that even better. Because uh, that will also show in the content and all that stuff. So that's what what I'm always focused on. But on the same note, on the growing of one oneself, nowadays I struggle that there are so many educational pieces out there, and you have so many sources where which bombard you actually with the information as well. So how do you go about selecting your mediums of study? Where are your I mean, where are your go to? Which are your go to? Uh, channels for education uh yeah so for uh, education in SaaS in particular i actually tend not to look for a lot of stuff that is directly in SaaS. so people that i follow in SaaS are like dan martel um he not because he has like good stuff on conversion he, he doesn't but he, he has like he's really experienced with leverage and hiring and and uh funding and numbers and all that stuff like other numbers that i'm never going to have experience with uh, at the moment all right because i don't have like a SaaS company myself so that's one way that i like to uh, learn and then other guys like west bush from the product like growth institute and all that stuff because they they've been testing out like a lot of things they they know a lot about that stuff uh, and and so on so it's probably like those couple people i follow and then everyone else i follow people outside the SaaS worlds I figure out what are, uh, I always like to look at people that are doing something that is the complete opposite way where you're supposed to do it, like quote unquote, supposed to do it. Um, and they're still winning, but like, but winning by like a mile. Um, and then um, figure out how we apply to the SaaS, right? So one guy that I absolutely love is uh, Alex Ramosi. Uh It focuses on services. 
Uh, but like just like you said, Dragos, I think the two features for SaaS are uh, becoming more of a media companies and generating that authority in that brand. But also, I think the software and service side are going to be like more of a hybrid more and more. And that guy's like complete genius at like selling services. And then I I, uh, I uh, try to figure out how to apply to SaaS. Right. Yeah, definitely. His his book, one hundred dollar offers, and I'm looking actually forward to to his ne- next book as well. But I yep. definitely I definitely watch watch every intervention of of him. I think his last podcast I've seen it's the one in uh, Louis Holmes, I believe. Very cool, very cool guy. I definitely recommend anyone to to watch Alex Hormozzi, especially on marketing and sales. I think he's a genius. Uh, if we're moving to our last uh, question. But because I just have one thing to say, just oh, because, sorry, 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 sorry. just because yep. you mentioned then, Pedro, you said you said the line, "I don't have uh, my own SaaS company." <laughs> Is it something you think about doing? Because you talk at the beginning about this inventor like mindset, right? Mm-hmm. This entrepreneurial mindset as well, and then you really niche down for seven years and you understand this sector so well. Have you ever considered, or are you considering, like taking the leap and doing something just completely yourself? Um, yeah, so I have like this five, 10 year plan. Um, and that's definitely in, in, um, in the works. So I'll tell you exactly what it is. I just don't have, um, uh, I'm an open book when it comes to that stuff. So, um, the first goal is to make sure that I get to multi seven figures a year. The reason for that is because it forces me to, uh, be better at hiring, be better at managing clients. Uh, it kind of forces you to be like the a really solid entrepreneur, right? So that's the first goal. Um, and also gives you a lot of, a lot of cash flow to play around with other stuff. So I'm not investing in anything besides myself until I get to that point, right? Uh, it's probably like one or two years away. Um, it's kind of hard to estimate anyway. So that's one goal. The second goal is now that I built a business that works like super well and it's super predictable for clients to get uh, insane results. Even if I try to scale the business, um, I'm scaling it and, and I'm bringing people to help clients with feedback. And I always doing it in a way where as I scale is only going to get better, uh, which kind of tricky to explain in this sense, but that's the goal. That's the thing that I, I'm only going to scale in that way. So that's the first goal is getting to that stage. The second goal is now that I created a, a, that sort of business and I can free up some of the, my time. I want to uh, build like, I wouldn't say like life's work, but that's similar to that. So I want to create a book similar to the $100 million offers from Alex Ramosi. That is going to be a complete game changer. Almost like I want to be like the lean startup for landing pages. I know I have it in my brain. I I want to do that for like uh, two or three years now. Um, but I know I, I, I cannot do it because I'm not going to have the time to promote it properly uh, and get everyone to read it. So I want to have this complete game changer where people are not going to look at, at landing pages the same because I know I have the, the information to do that. That's the second goal. And then the third goal, uh, only after that is where I would have, um, I would just, I, I wouldn't create SaaS companies. I'm, I would just like buy them and and, uh, uh, and improve all their metrics because when I work with clients, I work with uh, on three pillars, right? So how do we convert more visitors into leads? How do we make sure that they're turning to customers more often? How do we make them pay a little bit more? And all of this is related to messaging because it's always selling the value of next step. So I knew that I could buy a business and double it within a year. Um, and the reason why I don't do that now is because I need to be better at building a team. So I can just say, he, hey, I'm going to hire this guy. I know this guy is going to be like perfect for this. I'm going to train it in like uh, a month. Um, he's going to know exactly what to do. You do X, Y, and Z. And I, I and it's, it's very, it's much easier for me to make that work super well. Right. But before I get there, I need to learn the boring stuff. Right. So hiring, building a team, managing myself and my expectations and my goals and my process and all that stuff before I get there. Right. So that's like the five, 10 year plan. Uh, that's the ultimate goal. So it's long story short, it's, it's a yes, but not starting from scratch because Starting, uh, I, I hate the validating parts and I hate the um, like creating legacy and, and adding too many features to the product and all that part. I, I don't like, uh, I don't like that complexity. I'd rather, I, I like the selling parts. Sounds awesome. Let, let me know when you start. And if I've managed to progress along my five year plan, I, I might try and invest as well. <laughs> I think you've yeah, got all good. the ingredients to, to make a success of it. Um, so the last, the last, um, section is about, um, advice that you would give to other people. 
So obviously you have a lot of advice directly when it comes to things like landing pages and convergence and approaching certain problems. But if you think about somebody who's, I don't know, 15, 16, maybe a little bit older, liking the idea of um, becoming an entrepreneur or becoming a marketing person or, or a, a, co a kind of content writer, what was the kind of advice that you would give to people like this interested into breaking into this kind of uh, industry in this way? Um, yeah, I thought about it a lot because, um, um, you know, there are still like a, a, like a lot of young people that even if they're not like 15 or 16, they may be like 25, but they still want to progress to like a proper career and all that stuff. And I like still meet them all the time. So the advice that I always give is take the thing that people are doing and do like the exact, the exact opposite. But you have to do like the rule, the exception here is you have to do it in a way that you're going to smash everyone else. Right? Otherwise, you're just an idiot <laughs> if you do it the exact uh, other way, not, not winning. Right. So, um, for example, if everyone I, I told this to a friend as well, because uh, the job, the market uh, job market here is like pretty bad. So I told my uh, a friend as well, like instead of sending a resume and all that stuff, do the exact opposite. Send a video to the manager uh, or whoever is in charge of hiring and say, hey, this is what I can do for you. This is something I built just for you guys. This is why I would like to work for your company. In positioning it in how they could benefit from you rather than how you can benefit from them. All that sort of stuff. So that's always my advice is take something that uh, other people are doing and do the exact opposite because 99% uh, of the time, uh, the common, like the people that, uh, the things that people uh, think about uh, are all like pretty much always wrong, right? So that's the way I did it. And that's the way I would do it uh, all over again. But maybe, uh, maybe I'm a little bit too stubborn. <laughs> Sounds like solid advice. But would you actually, for instance, suggest anyone who'd like to break into marketing actually follow a marketing university? Uh, no, no way. I wouldn't do it. I'm uh, I'm also like a college dropout, but I dropped out of something totally unrelated because I, I was an engineering student, uh, like electronic, mm -hmm. electronic engineering thing. So the thing with uh, those universities and depending on the country and stuff like that is, um, and this this doesn't sound good, but I I um I don't like like if you're learning from a marketing school, like ninety unless you come to a really good one, it's not going to be available everywhere is you're learning from people that have actually haven't applied. And if they really know the stuff, they would be like really rich and they wouldn't be teaching, right? Unless they're really a philanthropical and all that stuff they want to teach to others and stuff like that, which is really rare. So that's the first thing. I never, I like, I have this thing where I never learn from guys that are like uh, people that are hypocritical, right? So I started, um, hypocritical, let's say. I started uh, also like going to the gym and stuff like that. I would never hire a guy that is not, uh, as big as I want to be, right? Jack, or as healthy Jack. as I want to be uh, and always uh, as focused as I want to become, right? Because there are a lot of those guys. So that's like uh, another area. Um, and I think it's just going to be a waste of time because you're just going to have to unlearn a, a bunch of stuff. If you're young, you're probably going to uh, come out of it with an ego that you know everything. That's another stupid thing. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, I don't see any advantage of it, to be honest. And if you spend like four years just trying to make your own stuff, you're just gonna, there's no way that you cannot succeed. And plus, you're going to develop the discipline to do it stuff long term. Oh, but the disadvantage, and I got that myself, is you're going to get this big repetition that you're a loser or something. You don't study or don't work or something. I got that repetition as well, but uh, it doesn't matter because uh, in the SaaS world, they know how successful I am. So I'm uh, almost like um, an unknown, let's say. <laughs> Anyways, I think you would listen to Alex Formosi, for instance, if you want to get jacked because he's proper big guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, it's, it's not that big. It's just uh, getting like more energy and stuff like that. Cause I struggled yeah, with that before. True. It's probably like nutrition and all that stuff, but that was a, that was an example. Super stuff. What do you think, Matt? Anything else we would like to ask Pedro? There's one, uh, like what we, we call it the bonus question. And I, and I don't know if you, if you kind of thought about this, but it's the kind of five top whatever it is that you feel like you want to share. I mean, you've already given so many great nuggets of very structured advice, but do you have something with regards to like five top, whatever it is that you think that could be applied um, to the kind of work that you do, or the kind of people that you're helping? Uh, yeah. So I would, um, this is something that I, that I talk about uh, often as well. I would probably say like the top five things that people like need to know from the website before they're like ready to buy from you. Right. 
So the first thing is obviously they need to know how they can make money with your products. So money could be uh, saving time with a tool, uh, like the other example I gave before, allowing to get more projects, uh, like improving the project output because, because of it. That's one example. Or save time. Or another client I had was uh, it had like a tool where it would... Um, answer the phone for you, for dentists and all that stuff. So we would say that every time you miss a call, they're going to call someone else. You might miss, miss like a thousand dollars worth of uh, dental uh, procedures. Um, and then we would quantify that problem. We would show it, we'd show how it solves. So essentially make it sure that how you make like a ton of money with your product, that's one thing. Then how is it better than other tools? Because if I feel like it's 10% better than what I'm using now, then I'm not going to switch, right? So for example, I'm using Trello to track the, the chats that I have on, on LinkedIn and the conversations I have going. Uh, if you show me like pipe drive or something, I honestly feel like it's not going to be better than what I use now. I just need to track, track it roughly. So I'm never going to buy it. Right. That's uh, another thing. Then the last, uh, the, the third thing is how long does it take to set up? So that could be divided into multiple things. So for example, um, um, how does it work with this tool that I use, right? So maybe we can divide this into another thing like integrations, right? Do I have to adapt to the process uh, that you guys created or can I adapt it to my tool? Does it work with the tools I already use? What are the use cases that I have with those integrations, right? So instead of just saying uh, what are um, it works with X, Y, and Z tool, why not say what you can do when you integrate with that tool, right? So for example, I've, I was doing a teardown a few days uh, earlier and there was a tool that would integrate with Zoom was one of the examples. And they said, you can use that tool to, based on the notes that you created in, in a Zoom meeting, you can add them to um, like the project management tool that I was covering, uh, right? So making that really actionable. So that's the third thing. Let's say it's the integrations or the process. Then is the onboarding slash setup, right? So how long does it take to be fully onboarded and how do you make that easier? And in most of the SaaS companies, they do this, but they don't they don't explain it, right? So sometimes they do the setup for them. They don't say that. Other times they do like 30 minute training sessions when they become a, a like a customer and they train their team on it. They don't say that. Uh, other times they have these huge list of guides and tutorials where you can watch them and become like a, a pro at using the tool in one hour. They don't say that. Um, sometimes people assume they have like the support overseas and it's going to take 24 hours to answer or they're not going to provide technical setup right so let's say you have a technical tool and and then you're never going to get support from a developer you're going to get a support from a guy that says oh uh try this x y and z and just going to sell you to a, a to a like a help desk type article they never say that right so that's yet another thing that needs to be addressed right um and then probably the final thing is the around the pricing right so what is the ROI of buying your products? Uh, which plan is right for me? Because one thing that I say all the time for the pricing uh, pages is I shouldn't, let's say you have four plans, regardless of you having four plans or not, the description of the plan and the way it's explained should be uh, so good that I look at the four plans and I only see one, the one that is built for me, right? So that's another thing. And there's a million things around pricing and how much they feel like they're getting versus how much they're paying and all that stuff. So th those are, I would say, are the five top five pillars that I would address. And this is on the entire website and how they see the product and not just one landing page. Perfect. Sounds great. Uh, yeah. Final thing. Are you going to Web Summit next month? Um, no, I, I'm not going to Web Summits. To be honest, I'm pretty lazy, lazy when it comes to conferences. Uh, I'm probably just going to rest uh, something else. Because I, I see like a lot of people that are not even in SaaS just checking it out. I, yeah. I, I don't... I don't, I don't feel like it's going to be, uh, I don't, I don't have the fear of missing out when, I, when it comes to web summits, that's for sure. Well, maybe if you're in Lisbon for some reason, the time we can meet up, we're going along. So I was thinking if you were there, we could maybe meet up and chat some more, but perfect. It's been, uh, yeah, so much yeah, good advice. Good. Massive, massive. Thanks, uh, Pedro. And by the way, guys, don't forget to hit the subscribe button on YouTube. You can listen to us. If you don't uh, want to watch the video version, you can listen to us on most of the podcast carriers. Don't forget to keep an eye on the analytics. We'll see you soon. Thanks again, Pedro. See you soon. Yeah. Cheers.